this is the sixth teaching uh, of the People's Green New Deal series. Uh, my name is Siddhant. Uh, I'm a member of the Science for the People Twin Cities chapter. I want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from uh, Dakota land, currently known as Minneapolis. I invite you to join me in acknowledging uh, the Dakota people uh, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. And I invite you to acknowledge the heritage of the land from which you join us today, with the understanding that this acknowledgement is merely a starting point for decolonization and liberation of the native people of this land. I want to give a few introductory notes before we get started. The teaching series is made possible through the tremendous efforts from folks of the editorial collective, of the most recent edition of the Science for the People magazine called The People's Green New Deal and the Climate Change Working Group. If you are interested in getting more involved with the Science for the People activities, the editorial collective for a future issue mm. of the magazine or the Climate Change Working Group, uh, you, you, will, you will see links in the chat uh, that will point you to these. Um, there are also links in the chat to subscribe to the Science for the People magazine and sign up for a special order of a print copy of the People's Green New Deal issue. The teaching series is, is endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America, the DSA. Uh, it's a nationwide eco uh, and, the, and the DSA nationwide eco socialist working group. Um, the DSA is the largest socialist organization in the USA with 85,000 members across the nation and growing. Uh, we encourage you to check out their work and join the movement if you can. Um, there should be uh, links to that in the uh, chat as well. Uh, um, uh, the Red Nation is also co-sponsored. This event is also co-sponsored by the Red Nation, um, the Great Lakes Chapter, which is a freedom council, which is a freedom council of the Red Nation organizing throughout the region. The Red Nation is dedicated to the liberation of native peoples from capitalism and colonialism. Uh, they center native political agendas and struggles. You can follow the Red Nation Great Lakes on social media to learn more about how to get involved. Uh, you will also find links for their social media in the chat. Uh, in this teaching series, we will be engaging, from, uh, engaging with magazine contributors as well as other thinkers and activists on wide ranging issues intersecting with uh, Green New Deal, uh, covering labor, energy democracy, agroecology, art and design, as well as looking for international and uh, looking at in international and indigenous perspectives. Uh, today we have two excellent panelists who are members of the Red Nation, which is a native led revolutionary organization comprising educators, students and community organizers advocating for native liberation. Our discussion today will be focusing on indigenous knowledge and the Red Deal. I will introduce them one by one and give each of them around 10 minutes to talk about their work. Then I'll open up the space for audience Q&A. Um, please feel free to put questions for the panelists in the chat at any point. Finally, at the end, I will invite each of the speakers to give a brief, brief closing statement, uh, key uh, takeaways. Um, and with that, we will get started. Our first speaker is uh, Brian Ward, who is an educator a socialist and activist who lives in Madison, Wisconsin, occupied Ho-Chunk land, and has lived and worked on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, home of the Oglala Lakota Nation. He's a member of the Red Nation Great Lakes and People's Green New Deal Madison. He contributed to the book 101 Changemakers, Rebels and Radicals Who Changed U.S. History, and his writing has appeared in The, in the Nation, Truth Out, New Politics, Science for the People, and more. Brian, please. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much uh, um, for the introduction and thank you all for um, coming today. Um, so kind of, I'm going to give a little bit of um, information around indigenous knowledge and then um, Tom will be following this up with talking about the Red Deal a little bit more. Uh, I guess before kind of I go ahead and get started, um, um, I'd, so a lot of this uh, 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 content that I'm going to kind of go over um, can be found in uh, the uh, in a couple of articles over in recent uh, Science for the People that I co-wrote with Regina Johnson, who is a fellow uh, Red Nation member, uh, um, uh, who uh, um, relatives are from the Otate uh, Missouri uh, tribe as well as the Ojibwe. 
from the uh, Turtle Mountain Band of the Chippewa um, and from an article from the Science Under Occupation as well as the most recent issue of uh, People's Green New Deal um, which uh, featured an article that both of us did with uh, um, Dina Gillio Whitaker um, from the Coville Federated Tribes uh, based in Oregon. Um, so uh, so that's is a, a lot of that's going to be coming from this. So I suggest people definitely check that on out. And full disclosure, um, I personally am not indigenous. I am indebted to the uh, many indigenous comrades and friends who have kind of uh, um, educated me on these issues that I've organized with. Um, so yeah, I'll just kind of go ahead and, and get started. Um, uh, most, so most people don't know what is meant when we say indigenous knowledge. Um, it is often referred to as traditional ecological knowledge or native science. Um, so Dina Gillio Whitaker, who I mentioned earlier, who's also the author of an amazing book that everyone should, should read um, called uh, The um, Indigenous, oh no, as, as the Long as the Grass Grows, um, The Indigenous Fight for uh, Environmental Justice from Colonialism to Standing Rock. Um, so strongly recommend that book, but she kind of defined it in the interview that we did with her, um, I thought in a really uh, uh, good way saying, Western science is the pursuit of knowledge, just as native science is the pursuit of knowledge. But, the, but with Western science it is very reductionistic, very concerned with mathematical equations and experimentation and replicability and uh, quantification. Native science is not so concerned with these particularities is more concerned with what you know about the world based on experience within, within it over long periods of time. Um, so in 2000, uh, Greg uh, Katake, who is a uh, Tiwa from the um, uh, Santa Clara Pueblo, published his book, Native Science, uh, Natural Laws of Interdependence, um, bringing attention to indigenous knowledge in the academy. Uh, indigenous people have always built relationships with their surroundings over thousands of years and the use of knowledge to live sustainably with non-human relatives um, and as a way to survive, obviously. Um, and today, um, there is both the growing ecological justice movement um, and a movement of scientists who are starting to see um, the connections between history, place, and solutions. Um, uh, uh, conne uh, connections that flow from the idea that we are not separate from nature. Um, and indigenous scientists have been actually uh, the ones that have been asserting this because it is not, we should not just say that it's just been Western science doing, doing it. Um, ecologist Corey Welsh, who's Northern Cheyenne, uh, wrote this uh, good quote that I really enjoy saying, indigenous peoples were always scientists. Their lives depended on it. Um, they knew what plants to eat, how to harvest game, and other practices that continue on today. Um, so like, you know, with that kind of base knowledge, we need to first off uh, take a step back and really understand the relationship of like indigenous knowledge and settler colonialism. Um, uh, the settler colonial uh, project in the United States, what is known as the United States today, has intentionally wanted to destroy and devalue this type of knowledge base um, that has allowed indigenous people to live and thrive on Turtle Island prior to an, uh, um, European colonization. And this has been a very intentional effort. Um, because the idea that land has always been at the center of the U.S. colonial project. As a country, the United States projects myths around the taming of the wilderness, implying that Turtle Island itself was empty of people when the settlers arrived. The reality is that there were millions of people living on Turtle Island. The majority were farmers who lived sustainably uh, with their non-human relatives. Um, in uh, this another really good book I strongly recommend called Redskins, White Mask, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition, Glenn Coltart, who is a citizen of the Yellow Knives Dine, um, describes uh, Karl Marx's theory of you know, what he called primitive accumulation or primary accumulation, um, whatever you want to call it, as the process where capital displaces indigenous population and privatizes the land to make it a commodity. Um, this is kind of what Coltart calls the, quote, violent transformation of non-capitalist forms of life into capitalist ones. The, that totalitizing 
power of capital in, North, uh, in the North American context required settlers and settler colonialism to overturn indigenous modes of production and relationship to the land and supplant it with capitalist markets. Kind of previously, most indigenous nations on Turtle Island did not have private property um, as, we, as we see it today. Um, land was more held in common. And among, uh, along with private property, colonialism brought individualism to drive the commodification of land. In contrast, indigenous nations relied on interdependence and what Winona LaDuc calls co-evolution with their environment and surroundings. Um, from the indigenous perspective, colonialism transformed abundance to scarcity. Um, and capitalism and settler colonialism weren't only based on land, but they were also put forward the idea of separating people from the whole living world. You know, that's a really important thing, like land, animals, and plants. They attempted to remove indigenous people from uh, um, uh, people because th their knowledge and connection to the homeland threatened that project. And that needs to be really important to understand. Capitalism needs to make land and the entire world a commodity in order to exploit it for profit. In order to do this, relationships to the non-human world um, had, had to be removed. Uh, the only relationships that were acceptable were humans with commodities. Um, this was both in the economic and political system. And the idea that so many indigenous nations took seven, looked seven generations ahead to, uh, to influence their actions today is fundamentally contradictory to the idea of short-term profits, which is the ultimate goal of capitalism. Um, and this type of siloing does not only happen in our economy, but it's reflected in Western ideas more broadly. Scientists separate from philosophy, spirituality, social sciences, etc. In indigenous communities, there, is, you know, there was no separation between these ideas. Science and traditional knowledge were integral to every aspect of society. Um, this connection strengthened their societies rather than weaken them, as a Western perspective might say. Today, indigenous knowledge is still being used and, the knowledge, um, and this knowledge needs to be at the center of our vision for a future. Um, I'm just gonna take a, uh, take a second to uh, quote uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's a scientist and citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. She said in this great book that I recommend everyone to read called Braiding Sweetgrass, said, quote, in the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital, or natural resources. But to our people, it was everything, identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained us. And this, this needs to, we need to understand when we think about indigenous knowledge that we can't extract it from uh, the fundamental flaws of capitalism and settler colonialism. Um, no, and now, now like thinking about indigenous knowledge today, I think there's a couple things to, to, to consider. And um, first off, seeing uh, what we've seen happen in California with, the, um, uh, with the, the fires that have been happening. Um, there's obviously, uh, you know, some people say it's exclusively climate change. Some people say it's uh, like Trump who um, says it's mismanagement. Um, but, you know, we need to understand that, you know, even though we know Trump is full of shit, that, uh, um, that there is a certain level of truth around that mismanagement. And that it has to its foundations in colonization. Because prior to Spanish colonization, indigenous nations used fire to manage the land sustainably. Uh, because of kind of white supremacist logic, many colonizers uh, cr um, chalk this up to kind of quote unquote crazy Indians. Just, oh, we, we don't understand this. But, you know, understanding that uh, uh, it's been centuries of mismanagement of the forest, um, you know, heightened where, with climate change um, uh, that has kind of led to this. And without kind of using indigenous knowledge, um, uh, it will continue to be mismanaged, especially as we view uh, our national forests and other forests um, as mere commodities rather than um, as uh, non-human relatives. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, here, I'm here in what is known as Wisconsin today. Uh, the Menominee na uh, Nation of Wisconsin um, is another really good example that I, I, I like to share. Um, 
uh, they've kind of always viewed their dense forests along the Wolf River in northern Wisconsin. So I'm in uh, what is known as Madison today. It's about four hours north up here um, as sacred and built a relationship with the forest. Um, and you can, you, can, you can feel this. Anyone who's been uh, to a, you know, uh, um, a clear-cut forest, it's, a, it's, it's, it's counter to the emotional feeling that you get, what, the emotional pain that you get in a clear-cut forest. But over generations, the Menominee have managed their relationship with the forest in a sustainable way and still do it today. And in fact, you can see their reservation from space. Um, I actually, um, since I do have sharing access, I, I do just want to share this one image uh, before I keep on moving, uh, just so you can get kind of a sense. Let's see. Did this actually work? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Loading up. You can see that is the outline from space of the Menominee uh, Reservation, surrounded by you know commodity-based farms and everything, um, uh, as opposed to sustainably run forest. And um, I'll stop sharing there, but um, wanted to share that image. Um, let's see, where did my? Sorry. Get. Okay. okay. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, and and actually, it's under it's important to understand like the Menominee, a really good example where um, uh, they have uh, the U.S. government has attempted to continue to eliminate the Menominee. Um, it was in the 1950s that they they put the the nation up for termination, which was systematically eliminating um, their uh, nationhood status within the United States. And it wasn't until the 1970s that grassroots uh, um, activism successfully reinstated uh, um, the nationhood of recognition by the United States. But we have seen that um, the land that they uh, currently oversee, 235,000 acres of land, um, has been reduced from uh, 9 million, uh, uh, 9 million less uh, than they had uh, prior to colonization. Um, and what's interesting is it's foundational to their, to the management of their forests uh, uh, through the Menominee tribal enterprises has based on rigorous understanding of the forest. And they've been able to sustainably use the forest, not just, not just simply, okay, we're just gonna leave the forest alone, but they have a, a timber mill um, and are able to both you know, uh, prioritize um, the, the, the health of the forest um, and still, you know, still have some industry for themselves. Um, in fact, uh, you know, most recently, they, their, their wood was featured on the NCAA Final Four last year. Um, so uh, to kind of wrap up before I pass it to Tom, um, just I think it's important for us to understand that there has been an unprecedented number of indigenous activists that have been dying in the Amazon, protecting their lands um, um, as governments and corporations vie for pro uh, power and profit um, because of this commoditization. And most recently, we saw last year the right-wing anti-indigenous coup in Bolivia, who overthrew their first indigenous president, Evo Morales. Bolivia, for those who don't know, Bolivia is majority indigenous, um, and he and he and his government helped uh, provide uh, uh, give rights to Pochamama, uh, uh, who is considered the Andean Earth Mother. Um, and more recently, uh, you know, just the, this last month, uh, the movement towards socialism voted out the coup government. Um, and that's a, uh, um, a important to progress. Um, and it's also important to understand that Western science has, used, uh, has been used, not saying that everyone in Western science has been used as a tool for colonialism at various points, um, viewing native people and cultures uh, as against progress. Um, However, the connection between Western science and indigenous knowledge are becoming stronger every day, and that's because of indigenous scientists and indigenous le leaders. Um, and really the survival of the planet depends on embracing these, uh, um, these connections. Um, um, and we need, to, we need indigenous knowledge at the center of our vision for a sustainable and uh, just future, because systems like settler colonialism and capitalism live off the death of the world around us while commodifying everything that we love and hold dear. Um, and these systems that intentionally separate our work and um, obscure our connection between them 
Um, and we need to fight for a decolonized um, turtle island that puts people in the planet before profits. And then um, I will, yeah, I'll pass it off to Tom. Uh, I guess uh, uh, he's going to be introduced and he'll talk more about the Red Deal and everything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for that very powerful introduction to Indigenous knowledge. Uh, our next speaker is Thomas Clem. Uh, Tom is a citizen of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. He currently is a doctoral student in political science at the University of Michigan, studying Indigenous politics and the politics of development. Outside of work, Tom is a member of the Red Nation Great Lakes and remains active in the Pokagon community as well as the broader Anishinaab community. Tom. Oh, bonjour, everyone. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a turtle clan Potawatomi from the Pokagon Band. Um, coming from, to you from Ypsilanti, which is Anishinaabe Aki, or Anishinaabe land. Um, so Brian did an excellent job surmising uh, the work of many indigenous thinkers. Uh, he's very good at that. And I appreciate him sort of setting the stage. Now I'm gonna describe who the Red Nation is, what our mission is, and sort of what it looks like to take an indigenous worldview and put it into a political worldview. So what is the Red Nation and who is the Red Nation? Well, we are indigenous revolutionaries. We are comrades and relatives first and foremost. We practice radical democracy and compassion for all relatives. Despite differences in organizational role or affiliation, we are equals in struggle. We are anti-capitalist and anti-colonial. We are indigenous feminists who believe in radical relationality. We do not seek milder forms of capitalism or colonialism. We demanded an entirely new system premised on peace, cooperation, and justice. For our, Lord, for our earth and relatives to live, capitalism and colonialism must die. We seek not just to challenge power, but to build power. We are not simply the negation of the nightmarish colonial present, colonialism, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, imperialism, and white supremacy. We are the embodiment and affirmation of a coming indigenous future, a future in which many worlds fit. We believe that all oppressed nations have the right to self-determination, to decide their own destinies. We, the Red Nation, are self-determining peoples. We enact the principles of freedom and integrity and in how we seek to live as good people of the earth. We believe in pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. We remain accountable to our people and our nations. We do not have perfect politics. We do not believe in factionalism or rigid ideology. We can die having the correct opinions but having accomplished nothing and freed no one. The desire to be perfect is the highest form of cynicism. Our role as revolutionaries is to cheerlead the movement at all turns. Above all else, we desire to be free and believe we will win. Optimism will thrive so long as we struggle for freedom. In short, the Red Nation is dedicated to the liberation of Native peoples from capitalism and colonialism. We center Native political agendas and struggles through direct action, advocacy, mobilization, and education. So what is the Red New Deal? <laughs> what is the Red Deal? Well, it's not the Red New Deal, that's for sure, Tom, because it's the same old deal. I study the New Deal, so I, I do this all the time and get uh, a lot of grief from my comrades. So it is not the Red New Deal, it's the same old deal. The fulfillment of treaty rights, land restoration, sovereignty, self-determination, decolonization, and liberation. Ours is the oldest class struggle in the Americas, centuries-long resistance for a world in which many worlds fit. Indigenous peoples are best suited to lead this important movement, but it must come from the ground up. The Red Deal is not a counter-program to the Green New Deal. It calls for an action, though, beyond the scope of the U.S. colonial state the great imperial Satan. It's a program for indigenous liberation, life, land, and life and land, an affirmation that colonialism and capitalism must be overturned for this planet to be habitable for human and non-human relatives to live dignified lives. The rag deal is not a deal or bargain with the elite and powerful. It's instead a deal with the humble people of the earth, a pact that we shall strive for peace and justice and that our movements for justice must come from below and to the left. We do not speak truth to the powerful. Instead, our shared truth makes us powerful. And this people's truth does include those who are often excluded from the realms of power and policymaking. 
In the spirit of being good relatives, the Red Deal is a platform that calls for many things. These include demilitarization, police and prison abolition, the abolition of ICE, tearing down of border walls, indigenous liberation de and decolonization, land restoration, treaty rights, healthcare, education, housing, full citizenship and equal protection for undocumented relatives, a complete moratorium on oil, gas, coal, and carbon extraction and emissions, a transition to an economy that benefits everyone, and that importantly ends the exploitation of the global south and indigenous nations for resources. Safe and free public transportation, restoration of indigenous agriculture, food sovereignty, restoration of watersheds and waterways, denuclearization, black self-determination and autonomy, gender and sexual equality, two-spirit trans and queer liberation, and the restoration of sacred sites. Thus, the Red Deal is red because it prioritizes indigenous liberation on the one hand and a revolutionary left position on the other. It is simultaneously particular and universal because ind indigenous liberation is for everybody. There is no hope in our opinion and in our view for restoring the planet's fragile and dying ecosystems without indigenous liberation. This is not an exaggeration, this is the truth. Indigenous people understand the choice that confronts us, decolonization or extinction. We cannot successfully wage class war until indigenous land reparation is taken seriously as a precursor to seizing the means of production more broadly. And US imperialism, the greatest threat to the future of this planet, will never end if land remains in the hands of first world settler capitalists. The collective future of all depends on the ability of indigenous caretakers to work with the land restore its health and reestablish balance with our relations. And we mean that these are our relations. With threats like radioactive contamination, wildfire, chemical pollution, and biodiversity loss, we need to look, we need to seek new and alternative technologies. This is something that indigenous people have always done. We are not stuck in the past. We are people who have always been innovators, scientists, and engineers. But we do know capitalists, uh, as it stands, tend to have a monopoly on technology with the majority of the most advanced technology being used for imperialism and war efforts. Scientists are often denied funding for projects that are not considered profitable or that directly disrupt the flow of capital to the already wealthy. What if instead this technology was created for the benefit of all life on earth for its relations? In order to answer this question, we must turn to indigenous knowledge. This is where we would get into, and um, uh, Nafis, uh, you, uh, all of you have done an excellent job posting PDFs and links to these books right away. It's been great. So what I'm, I'm going to sort of briefly talk about, I can't get into all of it or read all of it, uh, given the time constraints, is um, part three of uh, our Red Deal, uh, which is to heal our planet and to reinvest in our common future. So there's six demands in here that are elaborated, and I suggest that you read each and every one of them. There's no way I, in which I felt comfortable summarizing um, or taking any of the words out uh, of, of each of these um, that would make sense. So clean and sustainable energy, traditional and sustainable agriculture, land, water, air, and animal restoration, protection and restoration of sacred sites, multi-species caretaking, enforcement of treaty rights and other agreements. It's important to remember indigenous people make up 5% of the world's population, but 80% of the world's biodiversity and 11% of the world's forests. So I wanna end with this quote, as opposed to capitalism, indigenous people around the world do not see ourselves as separate from the land, water, air, animals, and human restoration does depend upon the health of the land. Restoring the land is the key to securing a future for all of us. Miigwech. All right. Uh, thank you, Thomas and Brian. Um, we have a few questions to get us started, but feel free to keep uh, chatting and asking more questions as, as you think of things. Um, 
so uh, one question that that is here is how how does how does the red deal and um, the indigenous uh, relationship to nature that um, it enshrines help us move away from the extractivist logic of capitalism, which has been replicated by many socialist states towards a more regenerative system. And I like, I mean, Brian mentioned about uh, the philosophy of thinking of the next seven generations. So how, how does that help us um, envision the next seven generations? Well, I think one of the things that the Red Deal does is it starts from a place of treating the earth uh, and, and, and the water th and all of these things as animate and, and relatives. Um, so how would you treat your relatives? That's, that's the basis of it. And then from there, we build our vision of what ought to be done. Uh, so from that premise, uh, you're gonna get different results than if you view nature simply as something to be managed, conquered, or even uh, nature is something simply to just make just habitable enough for us to be here, but rather something that you care about like you would a relative. Yeah, I don't really have much, much else to add there um, with what Tom said. Um, I think um, really it's also about, you know, democratizing things, right? You know, when we think about um, uh, the way that, uh, you know, with it, with the way that the land is viewed in a capitalist society, um, um, it's also not viewed that we have anyone has any say. You know, indigenous people and non-indigenous people alike. We just uh, see big companies like Enbridge and everything just do whatever is going to make them the most money. And so I think really uh, that uh, democracy is also um, uh, key to that. Real democracy, not not what we call in the United States. <laughs> Yeah, there's a question in the chat, uh, which I, um, I'm i also very interested in because I'm, uh, I'm in an ecology department, so it's particularly relevant to me. But uh, Chavi from the chat asks, how do we incorporate indigenous knowledge into STEM curricula? Uh, so I'm not in the STEM fields at all. Um, and Brian is a is an educator, so I'm sure he'll have uh, maybe some ideas as well. Um, but I will say um, there are people who I really recommend uh, reading, and one of them uh, is Kyle White, who hasn't been brought up so far. Um, another Potawatomi guy, so he's handsome, good looking, and extraordinarily humble. Um, uh, but also Robin uh, Kimmer is, is excellent. Kim Talbear, as Joseph said as well. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, so. But I, I don't teach, but so Brian might. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, I, I am a high school teacher. Um, um, there are, I, I know here in Wisconsin, I've uh, learned a lot from different um, organizations that actually um, attempt to do this, even though I am not in the STEM fields, I teach social studies, but um, uh, um, some really great connections here at uh, UW-Madison, uh, um, where uh, they've really tried to incorporate um, the um, uh, Ho-Chunk perspective on mounds in the area um, into the curriculum. And I think, I think a lot of it has to do with bringing the voices in the room, kind of like what Tom said. Um, there um, are plenty of an amazing indigenous scientists um, um, out there, as well as I think um, the idea of legitimizing indigenous knowledge, okay? So I think that's, that's one of the, the, the struggles that we see about around when we talk about just the West in general, um, Western science uh, and indigenous knowledge, like indigenous knowledge isn't taken as seriously. And you can even see that in when we talk about, you know, in the, in the history fields, oral histories aren't taken as seriously. It's really trying to uh, um, give, you know, as educators, um, give legitimacy to those, to our students. So they see them as legitimate uh, um, rather than just simply um, as just, stories or something like that. And I think that's, that's, that's the problematic nature of the way that we treat this stuff. And, and like I said in the talk, siloing things where we see the interconnectivity, um, I think is, is, is important. Uh, but yeah, look up the, some of these amazing people that Tom said that we quoted here. Kim Tallbear, as Joseph put in there, is amazing. 
Um, she has an amazing book called Native American DNA, which I would strongly, strongly recommend. Awesome. There is another question in the chat is, would it be better to donate to the nation whose land we work on, but who was first off it a long time ago, or to donate to the nations that are still alive in the south of the state? I don't know exactly how to answer that, because I think I'm a little bit maybe confused by the question. But I would say, no matter what, um, you know, try to be in a, some kind of good relationship with whatever, whoever the local uh, indigenous community is. Um, also, you know, uh, if you are in a classroom setting or a consultation setting, uh, I think it's important to, to pay people from these communities to come out and share this knowledge. I mean, they're, um, they are doing labor and, and often people can um, be exploitative of that labor. Uh, as far as donating to tr tribes specifically, I mean, uh, different tribes have, you know, different needs. Um, okay, so the closest nations are several hours away in Louisiana, so I wasn't sure the best way to build those relationships. You know, there are certainly uh, different state-recognized tribes I know of in Louisiana. Um, if they're several miles away, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly what to do. What you can do in the meantime is, is sort of read a lot of this work. Um, and be maybe donate to more broad um, uh, type of uh, movements or uh, you know uh, things going on. I mean, even just like if you're from Louisiana and you wanted to donate to stuff that uh, stops native uh, the native vote from being suppressed, uh, which we're seeing uh, more and more. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do uh, no matter where you are. Yeah, and I think what Tom kind of gets at is this really um, understanding that each nation is different, right? That there are different nations in different locations, um, um, different systems of government, all that kind of stuff. And I think really each locality is different. I'll just say also as an educator, there's, uh, um, there's so many teachers I know that um, they overly rely on just bringing guest speakers, as Tom said, not paying them um, to speak about, you know, uh, uh, um, about their experience, which is, you know, good to have them. But like, I know n native educators that I work with, they, <laughs> they're like, the teacher don't do, don't do any work and they just expect me to come in and then just, just say anything. So it's just like, you, you know, as someone personally as that is not indigenous, you need to do some of the work as well, right? You need to do some of the work to um, educate yourself and, um, and to help you know, build that relationship um, and, and to listen, right? To listen and um, sit back a little bit. Um, and, I mean, the great thing, I mean, very simple thing, all these nations have websites, you can email them, you can, you know, the great thing with technology these days too. Cool. Uh, there is um, the next question that is uh, is by Dorteen is, what are tangible actions we can take to support the Red Deal? I know it's difficult to answer tangible questions like that, but you know. So I think one of the things that you can do right now is uh, especially for given the, the crowd we're in, is, is make it part of maybe your study groups, um, share it, make sure um, people are aware of it. I mean, that's certainly what we're doing, but also be supportive of uh, different movements. And so we don't have uh, a claim to all of indigenous liberation. We're not doing all the work. The work's happening in all kinds of places. There are various land back camps across Turtle Island. Um, so I think just generally being in support of uh, indigenous liberation is one way, but also, also being in support um, of the various demands that we make in here. And, and, and again, I think consciousness raising um, is one of the most helpful things we can do. And then, you know, when it's time to maybe physically support, whether that means going out um, to protest, whether that means um, supporting uh, in whatever ways uh, you're able to, just being there and ready. Um, 
but we have a long way to go. Many people, I, I meet them all the time, forget that indigenous people are even a part of this polity. Uh, they were so erased in so many elements, including in a lot of areas of the left that have been that I think um, just making sure that indigenous folks are prioritized um, and are a part of the conversations and are at the, at, you know, in these conversations are the best thing you can do. And I also will say the ways you can support the green earth, ways you can support the red deal. Um, there's several instances within, within the actual text. And um, so I also recommend just, yeah, reading into those. Yeah, I think looking at the demands is really, is really key. You know, like I, I think about the red deal was, you know, you know, formulated before the recent uprising since the murder of George Floyd. Um, and all of a sudden, <laughs> defund the police and even the, the, the talk about abolishing the police is discussed, right? And like, it, it, the joke is that defund the police is now too reformist. Um, but like, that's in the Red Deal, right? We, we, uh, we're calling for defund the police. So you can, I think the biggest thing is reading through the Red Deal um, in both in your locality and how can you, because um, there's so much in it, how can you translate some of those demands into your local um, area? I know here in, in Madison, there has been a big push to reduce the budget of, of the police, right? Um, and so uh, there's been this push for a people's budget and bringing a lot of voices into the room. And I know a lot of us who have been in that room have done different um, study groups around the Red Deal and able to kind of, uh, um, you know, tangentially push that forward. So I think uh, that's a, a good way to do a close read of, of the Red Deal. I want to also say that any support of Black liberation is by nature supporting the Red Deal uh, and is supporting Indigenous liberation. Those terms are not mutually exclusive either. I want to make that uh, very clear. Um, so we do not see those as, um, we see those movements as having um, the same goals ultimately. Right. Uh, the the next uh, question, I think it has to do with reaching out to people. Um, and uh, it's uh, by, Christina has asked this question. Uh, people are conditioned to trust capitalism and considering anything else automatically gets you labeled as socialist or communist. Um, how can you reach out to these people? And this is an important and difficult question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the United States has been uh, a great, has done an excellent job at um, putting a lot of fear into those words. And, and we're seeing it, them still be used uh, with great success uh, in that regard uh, in this recent election. Uh, so I, one of the things is when, I, when approaching people about these things, I, you know, everyone's different. Um, making them see how their material conditions would be improved under this, especially if they are uh, a person of a background where that be the case is, is excellent. Um, but in general, I mean, it's a case by case basis. I'm not gonna pretend like I have uh, the answer to such a large question, but I do know part of uh, what the Red Nation does is is make these politics, you know, uh, one, it in, indigenizes them, so to speak, but it also makes it so um, socialist and, and communist movements are something that we think indigenous people should embrace. And I want to also plug um, our most recent, uh, yes, Miguel, Miguel is correct, our most recent uh, position paper, Communism is the Horizon, Queer Indigenous Feminism is the Way. And I want to quote and then, uh, Liam Miracle on this. I firmly, and she says, firmly believe that philosophy of my ancestors lines up quite tidily with the philosophy of communism. I make no apology for my principles. In our introduction, which is a, a great little cliffhanger, I suggest you read it after, um, says what the ruling classes call chaos is the inevitable cycle of a world able to survive only on violence against the people of the earth and the earth itself. The Red Nation stands with and moves with the people as we move together with the earth. Where have the masses gone these past months? We are living with a pandemic. Our relatives have died. Their 
proximity to premature death made more made ever more visible. It is no coincidence that within the United States, the workers, the dispossessed, and the black, brown, and indigenous masses have suffered the greatest losses. Our relatives from these same communities are on the street carrying the torch as the revolutionary moment flares. We have seen the domestic imperial forces burn. It is a time of extreme clarification. We are changed. This statement reflects this change. So I suggest that um, people then go read the rest of that position paper. Yeah, I think the only thing, only tiny thing I would add is just um, really is talking about ideas, right? You know, we are conditioned um, since, especially since the Cold War. Um, I think the younger generation is less conditioned around this of like, you hear socialism or communism and you don't really have a concept of what it is, but it's bad, right? <laughs> the boogeyman, <laughs> the commie boogeyman. Um, and um, I think, you know, meeting people where they're at is important, right? And it's talking about these issues that we're talking about um, because m most people, these people, I don't, you know, once again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but um, a lot of people um, don't see, the, see those connections. Um, obviously in this, in this environment here, I'm sure most people on this uh, on this uh, 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 webinar do, like don't necessarily have those ex same exact um, thought process. But I also think we need to also understand that the younger generation, as someone who teaches high schoolers, they don't have that Cold War baggage. You know, they're they're interested in these ideas, and um, yeah, meeting people where they're at, I think, is probably one of the most important important things. Meeting people with that sounds really good. Uh, we have uh, we have time for one last question before we move to closing statements. And um, the this question is by Joseph. Um, given that COVID is the result of extractive capitalism, would fundraising and mutual aid to aid the outbreak within the Navajo Nation, etc., be an immediate action to take within the Red Deal framework? Our chapter in East Bay, uh, the, which is East Bay DSA, is starting such a campaign and would want as much as possible to embody the principles of the Red Deal. Yeah, so I see uh, one of our comrades, Joseph, already mentioned there's many mutual aid projects going on in the Southwest, uh, in, the, in Navajo Nation and Pueblo territories. Uh, and the Red Nation is one of them. So um, certainly uh, by supporting those aids, uh, uh, those efforts, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent way um, to get on, uh, on board and, and certainly uh, feel free to reach, reach out to the Red Nation and, and, and certainly we can um, help make sure uh, those funds go to their proper use in, in different mutual aid programs. Um, uh, we currently um, are facilitating that uh, as we speak. So would you would you like to share uh, the info? We could share the info about these mutual aid programs later. On. Sure. Yeah, I can find. Yeah, if it's on our yeah. um, web page, but we frequently uh, post about it on our uh, social media as well. Okay. So definitely follow the Red Nation on social media. Um, you, uh, maybe we have time for one more quick question. What role do you think public policy makers on advocates can play in advancing land back campaigns? So policy makers, I think not standing in the way of the masses is, is one thing. <laughs> Thanks, Miguel. And then uh, two, not, uh, seeking to constantly water down or rationalize or create uh, a respectable sort of uh, version of that, not to liberalize it, uh, most importantly. These are first and foremost uh, radical demands. And when we talk about decolonization and liberation, we don't mean those in metaphorical terms. Um, so I think that would be my answer to that. Yeah, and I think I also, I just wanna note that our, our comrade Joseph just put a link in for the K in info shop, um, which has been doing a lot of stuff in the Southwest when it comes to um, mutual aid stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, I agree with Tom there. I think also, I mean, there are there have been various pieces of legislation, whether they're good or bad, that actually try to transfer management. I could you know one thing that comes off the top of my head is that has been uh, in and out of uh, you know, um, however flawed the Congress is of like you know transferring management of the um, of uh, the the, uh, so the the Black Hills National Forest to the Lakota. I think like there are things like that that um, obviously we need to push, but also you know get out of the way of uh, 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 as uh, Tom put. But also there have been an understanding that there um, like the Red Power Movement did actually um, force um, different lands to be uh, um, given back. Like the the Taos uh, Blue Lake was returned to the Taos Pueblo in um, 1970. Like I think well, understanding that. Uh, tangentially, um, there are even the limited reforms, there are um, examples of that based on the power of the movement that has forced the issue. Because we, <laughs> we know that the American settler state, it, you know, ever since its existence has stood in the way of, of any type of land back. You know, in fact, obviously, I'm doing the opposite. But um, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Uh, do you have last few closing statements to give? We could go with Tom first and then Ryan. Um, prioritize Black and Indigenous liberation and uh, good politics come uh, from down and to the left. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just say the final thing for those of you who are not indigenous on here as someone who um, also is not indigenous, I think um, really educating yourself is important and showing up. Okay, and not just, you know, you can go sit, read a book, whatever, that's good, but showing up and uh, building relationships in your communities, um, and then being familiar with the issues that are happening in your community as well. Um, uh, I know someone put in the chat around the recent kind of continued green light of the line three pipeline in northern Minnesota that goes to Superior, Wisconsin. You know, those types of struggles that are um, happening around the country. You might be saying, well, there's no indigenous struggle in my area. That's wrong. <laughs> That's wrong. There is, and you need to uh, um, you know, uh, get involved and um, educate yourself. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for having us on here. And thank you, uh, Brian and Tom, for uh, inspiring words and giving us very concrete action items and things to learn from. Uh, the next Science for the People teach-in uh, will be envisioning an internationalist Green New Deal. Brian will again be there, so definitely join. Um, this will be on the 4th of December. Uh, you can th There will be links in the chat uh, for the Facebook event and the Zoom registration link. And um, finally, if you are interested to get involved with Science for the People, get in touch with our Climate Change Working Group. Um, thank you all for attending and thank you, Brian and Tom, once again. Have a great weekend. Mama P.